What are the three types of muscle tissue? Actually, let's just see if you can remember this. So you and your neighbor, type in your three types, and what are the differences between the two, or three? Cardiac and smooth. All right, so what's the differences? Skeletal muscle is striated. All right, and so is cardiac. Smooth is not. All right, what else? Uh, cardiac has intercalated discs. Okay, good. C cardiac has intercalated discs and branching. Okay, where this does not. All right, they both have peripheral, wait, sorry. Skeletal has peripheral nuclei. Cardiac does not. Okay, um, what else? How about, go ahead. Good, that's what I was going to ask. So, skeletal is voluntary. Cardiac and smooth are not, right. Okay, so that means they're under different uh, control of different parts of the nervous system, right? All right, for the purpose of our next few class periods. We are going to talk mostly about skeletal muscle. We'll have a little bit about smooth, but you'll do smooth muscle next semester when you talk about the digestive system, and you'll do cardiac muscle when you talk about the cardiovascular system. So we're going to just focus on skeletal muscles for the next few days. Okay? <clears throat> All right, um, we're, we'll, we'll start structurally. So today's mostly going to be some anatomy. Tomorrow we'll get into, or Wednesday we'll get into how these parts cause a muscle contraction. All right, so we have in our muscles all right, this is a skeletal muscle. that was cut to look like a turkey leg. Um, and uh, they are covered in layers of fascia. Okay, so we'll do yellow for our fascia. Okay, and the outermost layer of fascia is the epimyceum. Okay, epi means outside, right? And that's covering the whole muscle itself. So if this is a biceps muscle, it has a layer of epimyceum surrounding it. Okay, and this is used for, can, can connect it to other muscles. So the epimyceum can attach to other muscles that are right, right next to it but mostly holds it in place, um, attaches to the tendon on the other side, um, and then as it's holding it in place, allows it to be elastic, to return to shape when it needs to, and then holds any nerves or muscle or blood vessels that may also be important to its function, okay? Now, if you did this cross-section, you would see these kind of circular sections within there where the muscle is then sectioned into what are called fascicles. OK? 
Okay, now I'm going to draw one of these fascicles out here. That's exaggerated. Okay, but surrounding each fascicle then is another layer of fascia. <clears throat> the perimyceum. Okay, but this is kind of like those Russian dolls. Okay. <laughs> the fascicles are then made up of a bunch of bound, more circular okay, muscle fibers. Which are the muscle cells. Okay, each fiber is a cell. And they each have then a layer called the endomyceum. The muscle fibers then have these repeating circular longitudinal organelles called myofibrils. And so the myofibril then is the organelle The fibers are the cells, the muscle itself is the organ, and the organ breaks up into fascicles, so on and so forth. So again, it is kind of like those Russian dolls. You just have smaller pieces making bigger pieces, um, which form the muscle. And then the fascia layers are in between them. Question. Yes? No, um, but they do have, so surrounding each, so you have the endomycium around them, and then each muscle fiber also has a plasma membrane. Which is called the sarcolemma. So that would be another organelle then surrounding each muscle fiber. And then it goes into the myofibrils. And we'll draw more detail on that in a minute. Questions? Yes. Right. Within the muscle cell. Right. And then so the covers the actual muscle cell. Right. And then the sarcolemma is just underneath the endomycium. And it's the plasma membrane. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Can I make the request that you don't use yellow again? Oh, uh, you can't see it very well? Yeah, I can use orange. That works better. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, yellow's gone. Orange is the new yellow. <laughs> okay. All right, so here's our muscle fiber. Okay, so we're just going to label this. We have a few things which we are familiar with, right? Our peripheral nuclei. Okay. Um, so these are controlling then 
you know, they're going to have the chromosomes, any genetic um, proteins and enzymes needed will be created in, um, in the nuclei. Well, the DNA is holding those. We have a lot of these um, funny looking organelles in there around our myofibrils. What are those? Powerhouse. The powerhouse of the cell. Okay, all right. <clears throat> Why would it be important to have lots of mitochondria around these? Yeah, because you need ATP for the muscle action, for the contraction. Okay? All right. Um, then this is our endomycium surrounding the cell. All right, then this is our organelle over here. Our myofibril. And then the, you see this band here, that's the striation, right? So that's, and we'll, we'll talk about what those are in a second. Okay, um, all right, so we'll come back to this. There's some important parts here, but um, this, this repeating segments, what you have here are light and dark areas which create our striations. What that is, well then, so is the sarcomere, which is our fundamental unit. of skeletal muscle, all right? So this is where the magic happens, all right? And it's a repeating unit all along that tube which creates those striations. So we're gonna draw this sarcomere starting with Um, this is the actin, which equals our thin filament. Okay, this is a protein. And we call it the thin filament because compared to our thick filament, which is myosin, it is much thinner. Wait, was the myosin the thin one or the actin? Actin's the thin one. Myosin is thick. And what you have here, the zigzag part I drew, is called the Z-disc or the Z-line. Which is the anchor for these thin filaments. So they are tied to the Z-line and then they break off from there. And then there's another one on the other side. And this just repeats itself over and over. So over here, you're going to have another myosin. And then over here, you also have another myosin. And 
and it just goes over and over again for the length of the cell. All right, so what we have here then is um, overlapping parts of actin and myosin. And the, where the overlap occurs or doesn't occur has a specific name. Okay, and so we will label these. So from Z line to Z line, that is the sarcomere. From Z to shining Z. Thank you for that big laugh. I need that. Good. Yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> within the sarcomere, then, we have this one part where it's only myosin. Okay, this is called the H zone or the Healy zone, which refers to light. Okay, and myosin is lighter than the parts where it's overlapped, where it's darker. Okay, so this creates the light bands in your striations. In the very middle of the myosin, which is also the very middle of the H zone, is the M line. Okay, this isn't even really a structure, it's just an imaginary line we drew in the middle of the myosin. But it's the, it's the very middle of our sarcomere as well. All right, and then we have this section over here called the I band, where it's actin only. Right, the H zone is myosin only, and the I band is actin only. So all that we have left then is this overlap of I band, or sorry, overlap of actin and myosin, and this is called the A band. All right, that's the sarcomere. It's that simple, guys. <laughs> that's it, right? We're going to, uh, and we'll talk about what happens. Well, well, we'll do a little bit today. But once you run through the whole cellular process, like it, it'll all come together, OK? Right now, we're just, yeah, literally, good. See, we got, I'm not the only jokester here. <laughs> okay, this is the figure from the book. All right, so based on what we did, can you label everything on the sarcomere? Yes. Okay, do it. You can cheat and go back and forth. You should also add, right, from here to here, what is that? Sarcomere, good. And then this one right down the middle. The M line, right? All right, so what, this isn't the only structure of the cell, right? This is just one organelle and its repeating unit, the sarcomere, right? The myofibril. 
but you also have other things which are important for its function. So, if you remember the sarcomere, or, yeah, the, the um, sorry, sarcolemma. It is over all this, and it actually has these little projections which go over the Z disc called a T tubule. Oops, sorry, this is yellow. I can take it off here altogether. Both. Either or. That's not orange. Here's an orange. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Still kind of yellow. It's, it's darker. That's like a spicy mustard. I agree. So Dijon. <laughs> All right, so the T-tubule then extends and goes over there. Um, what you also have is what's called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Okay, and this is just going to be a green blob on here. Right here, I'm going to draw it like this. Okay, SR. Okay, sarcoplasmic reticulum. What does that kind of sound like when we were talking about organelles? <laughs> All right, so this is the endoplasmic reticulum of muscle cells. Okay, and the very ends are called terminal cisterns. What's a cistern? Yeah, something that stores something, okay? So we have a terminal cistern on that side. We've got another terminal cistern on this side. And those three form what's called a triad or triad. And what you have here is a bunch of calcium. All right, and the calcium is an important signal for the contraction to start. Okay, so the calcium sitting there, waiting there. Once it gets a signal, it'll release calcium into the sarcomere, which will start the contraction process. All right, but now we have then kind of the full picture of all the pieces on the myofibrils. <laughs> All right, we just drew actin and myosin as little pieces, right? But in reality, they're, they're more complex than that. So actin is structured like these little balls <coughs> that are strung together. And they have little divots in them called Myosin-binding sites. And believe it or not, the myosin actually binds at those sites. <laughs> See, so not everything is just some random Latin term, okay? 
We could maybe translate that into Latin if we wanted to make it more congruent with the rest of everything. Do we have any l classical studies majors here who could help us with that? <laughs> That's why, that's why I have them here, you know. <laughs> Helping me out. Okay. Myosin, which is thicker, has these heads on it. Okay, so all of these are sticking out of that thick filament. <clears throat> and they have a little site for ATP. Okay, and then they have ATP ACE, so they can break apart ATP and use it for energy. And that allows those myosin heads to move, okay, and bind at the actin sites. But that can't occur because you've got a couple of things preventing that. Uh, troponin, okay, which acts as an anchor for, let's just use orange here. tropomyosin. And what tropomyosin does is it blocks the binding sites. So if tropomyosin is, <clears throat> is in the resting configuration, it would be right over those binding sites. I know I didn't draw it that way but it would be right over those binding sites, and then so the myosin heads would not bind there. Okay. But, which we'll learn about on Wednesday, when calcium, when the <laughs> calcium signal comes in, it causes tropomyosin to shift, and it peels back, and then exposes those binding sites, and then myosin can go in there and bind. Okay, so this is at the very, this is at the protein level. So we're beyond cellular, we're, we're within the cell looking at the organelle. How do these two proteins work together? And what happens then is when they contract, the troponin and tropomyosin moves back out of the way, and then those myosin heads fit into the binding sites of the actin, and then it shifts, it shifts the actin towards each other as it grabs on and pulls the actin. <clears throat> so what you can see here is our H zone shrunk, right? When contraction occurs, the H zone uh, shrinks, right? And in addition to that, I don't have lots of the A bands here, but these myosin. Um, filaments would then be closer together. So the A bands they move closer to So they don't shrink, but they because we have less of an H zone one A band so the next A band has a, has a shorter distance between them. And our I band so 
draw that up here a little bit. Our I band also got shorter. Now the only way this works, the contraction works, is if at resting state you have an H zone, you have space there to fill in after contraction. So the resting state has some overlap but not complete overlap. And then during contraction, because those myosin and actin heads are interacting and pulling each other closer together, we have these three things occurring. Okay? And those are the basics of how your muscles contract.